All right. Well, mighty fine. Good morning, everybody. We uh, are getting started here. We're going to give it a few seconds to let people finish coming in from the lobby area. So I'm going to be watching the count as we come in. Give it about 10 seconds or so, and then we will get started for the day. All right, it looks like we have most everybody in from the waiting room, so we'll go ahead and get started. Mighty fine good morning, everyone. My name is Cale Harbor. I am the product manager here at Advanced Control Solutions, and I have the great privilege to have with me today Mr. Georgie Das of Midwest Optical. Uh, nice to have you with us this morning, Georgie. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining today. A couple of the little housekeeping rules that we've got is I'm going to be monitoring the chat room, so if you have questions, you have things that you need Georgie to expand on or be able to answer or additional details, please be sure to post it in the chat room. I'll be monitoring that and be able to feed those questions during the training that we have going on this morning. Also, when we get done, this is going to wind up being posted on our website for our on-demand webinar library. So if you would like to go back through the presentation or if there's someone else within your organization that you think would benefit from it, you'll be able to direct them to our website and be able to watch that from our library list there. So looks like we've got everybody in and those are the basic rules. So uh, Georgie, I'm going to let you take it from here. I understand you've been with uh, Midwest Optical about seven years now. That's right. Yeah, seven years and I uh, help with the technical training there uh, among some other things. But uh, yeah, just um, great to be here and excited to get into some optical filters with you all. All right. And optical filters, if you have worked with them before, you already know the importance that they play in a machine vision application because the quality of the image is the data that's coming in to be able to make a decision on a product looking for a defect or a count or being able to see what you need to see to inspect. And, and those little optical filters make a big difference in success and failure, don't they, George? In, indeed, yep, yeah, they do. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to let you take it away from here. The folks did not show up to hear me talk. They would much prefer to get the training from you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, and uh, good morning once again. Uh, I'm just going to turn off my uh, webcam here and share my screen. All right, and Kale, can, uh, can you see my screen in here? Yes, it's coming through very well, Georgie. Okay, great. Well, good morning once again. My name is Georgie. Thank you, Kale, for uh, such a warm introduction. Um, I've been with Midwest for about seven years and I help with technical training and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about optical filters. Um, as we're getting into it, um, like Kale uh, so graciously mentioned, um, you know, we really want to impress upon you this morning that filters are a necessity, not just an accessory. Um, oftentimes when you're thinking about an optical filter, either you haven't heard of optical filters or have, you've never used one, um, or if you have, there's something of an afterthought. Uh, they're considered an accessory. If you go to buy one, they're usually listed under accessories. Um, but again, what we want to impress upon you this morning is that um, they're absolutely a necessity. Um, so when you're considering uh, your camera, your lighting, your lens, um, you know, we'd like for you to start thinking about the filter because it's going to help you with uh, several things as, um, as we're going to discover here. Before I get into uh, different types of optical filters and how they can help in your applications, uh, I just want to go over a couple of key terms and describe what this image that we're looking at is. Uh, this is called a transmission curve. Um, this accompanies every optical filter and uh, it presents a lot of data. It lets you know how the filter is going to perform. Uh, the primary use of an optical filter is, is, is mainly to control light, um, whether that's blocking certain light uh, waves through, um, or maybe you want to see a certain range of the spectrum, like you want to see just the visible or just the infrared or just the, short, um, the shorter UV uh, wavelengths. Um, uh, optical filter is going to help you do that. Um, and this transmission curve has uh, several uh, components to it. 
um, along the y-axis here, I have transmission, uh, the x along the bottom. I have um, the wavelengths that are broken down into uh, nanometers. And uh, the spectrum you'll notice starts at about 300 nanometers, which is our UV. And then it goes into visible, which is what our human eyes see. And to the right, it starts to go in, into the infrared. Um, uh, so we call these the longer wavelengths to the right. Um, so uh, the infrared that we're seeing here is near IR. Um, and then we get to shortwave IR. But the spectrum keeps going. However, we're just focusing on what we see on this curve right here uh, because machine vision, um, or at least the, the filters that we produce are really focused at this part of the spectrum. And um, the, you know, the cameras and the technologies that we support uh, are based in this part of the spectrum. Um, this transmission curve has a pass band. If you've ever used a band pass filter before, um, that's where it gets its name because of this pass band. And this lets me know um, what part of the wavelength is being allowed through. Uh, the out of band refers to what's being blocked. Um, so if I say a particular filter has very good out of band blocking, um, then, then it's doing a good job of suppressing or blocking certain wavelengths. Uh, the transmission means how much of a particular wavelength is being let through or a, a color, if you will. Um, if you have very good high transmission in a certain wavelength, it means there's a lot of that wavelength uh, being, um, being allowed through by that filter. Uh, the full width half max refers to um, uh, how wide that pass band is. Uh, if you're using a broadband uh, uh, light source, something like an LED, you'll probably want a band pass filter with a wider pass band. If you're using something like a, a machine vision application for a laser um, detection application, you might want something narrower. All right, so. We'll uh, refer to a few of these terms as we continue, but um, I think it's important for us to know uh, as we continue. So filters are helpful for uh, lots of things, and we're going to be focusing on um, these six things primarily this morning. Um, filters are essential for helping with contrast, uh, uh, resolution, repeatability. Uh, they help to reduce glare, um, color correction, and also protection. Um, so here, um, these are the things that we're going to be looking at this morning. And filters help to create contrast. Uh, in machine vision, contrast is the name of the game. Uh, you're trying to create some contrast between uh, a barcode in the background, um, or maybe you're trying to detect some adhesive on a part or looking for a marking. Um, just like Kale mentioned, um, you know, creating that contrast, being able to get a clear image is the data that your application is, um, is needing. And so filters really help to do with that. Um, here's an example of how bandpass filters work. Um, and um, in a monochrome application, they can help with maybe a color sorting application. Um, now, if you have the original color image of these red and blue bottle caps, you can see, you can tell the blue and the red apart you know, very easily. But what if they were in a monochrome application um, and you didn't have a color camera? Um, well, it's a little more difficult to tell them apart. But if you're using um, some bandpass filters here, I'm using a red and a blue one. Um, I can see that when I use a red bandpass filter, it passes the red wavelengths and blocks the blue ones. And in a monochrome application, what happens is when you pass a wavelength, it becomes lightened. Um, and when you block, it becomes darkened. So as you can see, the red wavelengths are being passed by this red bandpass filter, and the blue ones are being blocked. And you can see that in the sample transmission curve here. I'm passing red, but blocking blue. Now here in the, uh, at the bottom, I'm using a blue bandpass filter just to show you the kind of um, what happens, the reverse. I'm passing blue um, wavelengths, so they become highlighted, and the red become darkened. You can see that in the transmission curve too. So uh, very easy to create contrast um, with monochrome applications with bandpass filters. Um, bandpass filters uh, can also help with resolution. Uh, there's a type of distortion that occurs in lenses um, called chromatic aberration. Um, this is something that happens when um, the lens is not able to focus all the colors or all the wavelengths of the same convergence point. Uh, this is because different wavelengths have different refractive indexes and they bend differently. And the lens tries to focus them all at the same point, but is not able to. And so what happens is 
Um, there's some loss of resolution. Um, you don't get as sharp of an image. But if your application is only looking for a certain color, for example, let's say you're only interested in, in something that's blue, the blue wavelengths, and you want to block everything else. Well, by using an optical filter with your lens and limiting the incoming wavelengths, your lens doesn't have to work to try and focus all those wavelengths. And you actually are able to uh, gain some resolution. And you can see that the difference between these two images here. Hey, Georgie. Yeah. Had a question uh, be sent to me, and now it looks like it might be a good time to ask it. Sure. With the use of these filters and the band pass and what you're describing to be able to make features come out and the improvement in the focus, does this give an advantage to a monochrome-based camera over a color-based camera? Yes, that's what that's what we see um, a lot of customers end up doing is they maybe started off with a color camera because, okay, we have a color sorting application or we need to see some kind of color. Um, and so they go with the more expensive color camera, um, a high a high resolution lens, but um, we've been able to see much better results with maybe a monochrome camera and um, a bandpass filter. Um, and so lots of customers actually actually end up switching that way. They're able to save money, um, you know, just reduce the overall complexity, not a lot of post-processing, um, just because you the contrast pops out, um, you know, much clearer, um, uh, like for example, this image. All right, thank you, Georgie. Um, so, you know, uh, contrast, resolution, let's talk about repeatability and how filters can help with repeatability. Um, we call filters an inexpensive insurance policy just because they help to ensure that the application um, is going to be repeatable. Uh, now, what I mean by that is um, oftentimes when we're designing an application, we're designing it in a maybe a room that uh, reflects this image where lighting conditions are ideal. Uh, maybe it's a lab. Um, and there's no windows, and you get your application working perfectly, um, and it's good to go, and then we move it to the customer floor or the customer site, or maybe we roll out an application to multiple sites all over the United States or all over the world, and all of a sudden things stop working correctly. Um, and it's because you've introduced all this ambient light that wasn't pre present when you were um, making your application or creating or testing your application. Uh, there's all these, there all, there's all this overhead lighting, there's skylights, there's people walking around and, you know, reflecting things off of their clothes. Um, and so short of building an entire shroud to encompass your whole application and to block out any ambient light, which is going to take up a lot of space and, and um, probably cost a lot, um, what you could have done is used a bandpass filter. And we want to impress that, again, filters are a necessity. Uh, and not just a bandpass filter, any filter that can control uh, ambient wavelengths. If you used a filter from the very get-go, from uh, the beginning, you'd be controlling what light is entering the system, um, blocking any interfering light, and passing only the desired wavelengths. And so you're essentially shrouding the system, um, but instead of creating a big shroud, you're um, just putting something on the end of your lens um, that is doing the work for you. And so... Um, to ensure that your application is going to work regardless of the environment. Um, sometimes you don't know what the environment's going to look like. Using a bandpass filter um, um, or an optical filter is a, is a great, um, great, great choice. In addition to bandpass filters, um, uh, Midwest Optical Systems offers lots of different filters, uh, including short pass, long pass. Um, and while acrylic is not a type of filter, it's a type of material, um, I want to talk about some of the benefits um, from, from using that type of material. Uh, polarizers, neutral density, and multi-band pass. So we'll cover these filters, um, talk about how they can help in different sorts of applications. Um, I want to present some images um, from real-world applications to help you think about how you can use uh, more of these types of filters in your applications and how uh, genuinely they can help you solve some applications um, or some issues that you might be having in your applications. First filter that we're going to talk about is a shore pass filter. If you remember from my um, initial um, transmission curve. This left part, uh, the UV, the, the visible, we call the shorter wavelengths, and um, to the right, uh, we're going to call the longer wavelengths. And so a short pass filter helps to pass shorter wavelengths and uh, block longer ones. And uh, this is often called an IR cut filter. And uh, this is really useful for um, helping to achieve natural color rendition. Uh, in this application uh, example here, 
Um, we had this customer who set up multiple color cameras around this football stadium. And uh, when they're looking at the image, there was a weird pink red hue that was coming across. Um, obviously it didn't look pink or red to our human eyes, but the camera was picking it up. And it turns out that particular color camera that they were using did not have a filter to cut out infrared. And so the sunlight, the stadium lights um, um, was giving off a lot of IR that uh, the digital camera was picking up. And so a short pass filter helped to block those longer wavelengths, interfering wavelengths, but pass uh, the visible wavelengths that again, uh, produce a natural color that our, that our eyes are used to. So short pass filters, also called IR cut filters are really helpful um, in those types of color applications. They're also helpful for helping to prevent laser damage. Uh, if you have an application where you're inspecting um, something with the laser, uh, or maybe a laser marking application uh, that's, that's using an infrared wavelength of laser, uh, you'll want to protect other camera systems that are in proximity or um, uh, other people's, um, you know, people's eyes as you're walking around or, or near the application. And so a short pass filter, because it's able to help uh, block infrared, um, is, a, is a great way to protect your camera and your sensor. Now, short pass filters uh, come in different varieties. They come with reflective um, or absorptive types. And so when you're selecting a short pass filter for uh, preventing laser damage, you want to make sure that you select an absorptive type of filter. This will help to absorb laser energy instead of reflecting it again into another camera system that's in proximity or into somebody else's eyes. So short pass filters are great for achieving that natural color rendition uh, and helping protect in um, uh, preventing laser damage uh, in laser marking, laser etching um, kinds of applications. Now long pass filters, um, these help to pass longer wavelengths and block shorter ones. Um, you know, we don't use a ton of these in machine vision applications, but um, we're seeing some more and more use cases, especially when they're uh, testing out infrared applications. Um, as you probably know, a uh, standard CCD CMOS uh, sensor on a, on a, you know, standard machine vision camera, uh, this is what the camera is able to see. Um, you know, mostly the visible, um, but it also has some sensitivity in the IR, in the near IR. And so what I'm doing with this long pass filter is I'm blocking the um, UV and the visible, but really increasing the efficiency um, you know, of what's, what the camera is able to pick up in the near IR, however little is, it is. Um, so in this application, I was able to test with these, these clear water bottles. Um, I was using an infrared light source along with my uh, long pass uh, filter. Um, I was able to see how the water was absorbing the infrared wavelengths of that light source. And so I, again, this helps you, um, uh, helps you to test. And also if you have an application where you need to block UV and vis, then um, long pass filters are a great option for you to test with um, and to use in your application. Hey, Georgie. Yes. We had another question come in and it seems like the right time for it. In this particular application, you've got a front facing light. Is there a recommendation when you're doing this is a backlight or a front light preferred, or does it matter? Um, this is just an example application. Um, there's different reasons why you'd want to use a front um, or a back, you know, space constraints. Um, glare might be an issue, and we'll talk about glare. In this application, I'm using a polarizer to reduce that glare. Um, if you want to see the outline of the bottle, um, so, there's different reasons why one over the other, but in this application, I'm using a front light. All right, so it really sounds application dependent and testing required. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I mentioned as we were um, starting out the types of filters that we talked about, and I mentioned acrylic. Um, now acrylic is not really a type of filter, but it is a material. Um, all of our other optical filters that I'm talking about are, are made on glass. Um, and so their um, glass is taken, a coating is applied to create um, the pass band and the out of band. Um, and we can also coat acrylic. Um, and one of the great benefits of acrylic is that um, it's very high in optical quality. Um, it's also very easy to work with. And so if you need a custom shape or a size, um, they can be laser cut 
you also, if you have an application where you can't have glass um, in the open, for example, maybe a, a food or drug inspection application, um, you need a way to cover the front of your lens or protect the front of your lens, um, or if you need a enclosure window, um, then acrylic is a great option. Uh, now, some folks may stay away from acrylic, acrylic because they may assume it's kind of a cheap plastic. Um, and so because of that, um, you know, there's some, um, because people might think that, um, you know, they might stay away from acrylic. And I understand why, because they've used a polycarbonate kind of plastic window before, and they've seen the buyer infringence effect, or they've seen um, the rainbow effect when using a polarizer. Um, but the acrylic that we're offering and that I'm talking about this morning um, is an optical quality acrylic uh, that's cast and not extruded. And so these types of effects won't happen. And so uh, acrylic is a great option to, you know, to use as a cover glass, a cover window, sorry, cover window, not glass, um, but for your enclosures to mount at the end of the lens to protect in various kinds of environments. Um, optional coatings can also be applied so that um, the performance of the acrylic is increased. Um, and these are also available on some of our uh, glass options, but we can apply coatings like oleophobic, um, hydrophobic, uh, and these help with, um, the oleophobic help with anti-smudge or, um, you know, re reflect, deflecting oil or liquids off the front. Um, hydrophobic is um, more anti-fog. And so if you're mounting this onto an aerial application, um, uh, these, can, these can help protect, again, your enclosures, uh, your camera systems. And so acrylic is a great option and these optional coatings uh, make them even better. Hey, Georgie. Yes. Uh, next question came in. Can you combine filters? In other words, can you add the hydrophobic with a bandpass? Uh, that's that's definitely possible. Yes. And um, you, you know, if there's a, a some of our filters actually have this coating applied already, but um, some of them can be applied after the fact, um, or they can be designed with both coatings in mind. So we have lots of custom options. Um, we have some off-the-shelf off the options as well. All right, thank you. Um, as we continue, our, our, our next filter and kind of application type of discussion is polarizers. Um, if you've ever gotten into glare issues with your applications and you've probably um, either used or been uh, uh, referred to a polarizer, um, polarizers are great and they really do help with reducing glare, uh, especially if you're inspecting something shiny, like a, something that's plastic wrapped or something that's uh, aluminum. Um, polarizers can, can provide a lot of benefits. Now, there's different kinds of polarizers. Uh, there's polarizers that are, um, we call linear polarizers and um, these are made for visible light sources. We have circular polarizers and the circular doesn't refer to the shape of the polarizer, the physical shape, um, but instead of how it's working. And these aren't really used a lot in machine vision applications they are more used in uh, cameras that have in metering lighting systems, uh, but they're still available um, if you're using that type of camera. Uh, we also have uh, wire grid polarizers. Uh, the visible linear that we offer uses a, a die that's um, that's in the material that helps to block uh, visible light. And in a wire grid polarizer that's mostly used for infrared applications, um, it's it's a microscopic wire grid that's embedded um, in that uh, in the glass or the film, whatever you might be using. And so determining uh, you know what kind of light source that you have uh, is very important. Knowing what kind of light source you have is important when you're you know selecting a polarizer. Uh, if you're using an infrared li white light source, or sorry, infrared light source, uh, you're going to want to get a wire grid polarizer as opposed to just a, um, a linear uh, die, dot, uh, die made one. Um, the other thing to keep in mind when using polarizers is that you're going to want to use uh, polarizing film um, and polarizing filter. Um, we have polarizing filters that go on the lens and also polarizing film that goes over the light source. Uh, this is kind of the most efficient way um, and the best way to extinguish as much glare as possible 
Um, the polarizing film comes in several different types of materials that come in a, almost a plastic film, but we also have uh, glass options and they can be cut to different shapes. They can have mounting holes placed on them. Um, so it's very easy to, to uh, mount um, onto, the, onto the light source. Um, oftentimes our customers will just give us the part number for the light that they're using and we're able to um, design very quickly uh, a film that can either be um, adhered onto the front of that light source or again mounted with holes. And so it's important to keep in mind um, when you have an application and, and that light source is causing the glare um, that you're gonna wanna use both the polarizing filter and polarizing film. Now, um, I just wanna break that down in this application here. Um, I have this application where um, they were looking at these labels and they were highly reflective and, and very shiny. Um, as you can see on the application image one here that has no filter, um, has lots of glare, uh, very difficult to see. I had a polarizing filter in the second image to my lens, uh, not much difference between image one and image two. Um, in the third image, I'm adding a polarizing filter and polarizing film. Uh, so polarizing filter on the lens, polarizing film on the light source. Um, and you can see how much, uh, how drastic the difference is um, when using those together between image two and image three. And finally, I'm using a red bandpass filter um, in addition to my polarizing filter on the lens. Uh, this is just helping to reduce some of the uh, glare that was being caused by some ambient light. Um, and so um, this, um, this allowed me to just really clean up the image and um, create uh, just a, a clear image with no glare. And so again, polarizers are, are very effective. And um, biggest reminder is to make sure that you polarize both your light source and lens, and also pick the correct polarizer for the light source. Um, in the if you remember with the, when I was talking about the long pass filter, um, and I showed you this application, I'm using an infrared light source and it was very, um, there was a lot of glare, but using uh, polarizing film and a filter on the lens um, really helped to reduce that um, glare. The next kind of filter that we'll talk about is a neutral density filter. Uh, neutral density filters help to reduce the amount of light um, amount of transmission. Um, the filters that we talked about um, such far, like a bandpass filter, uh, short pass filters, they help to increase as much uh, of uh, the wavelength that you're interested in as, as much as possible. Neutral density filters are like sunglasses for your system. They help to reduce that light intensity. This is useful through applications where there may be a, a welding application where you're dealing with a lot of bloom, lots of light, and they uh, saturate that sensor so you can't get a clear image. Um, and so um, th that's one you know, great reason to use neutral density filters. Um, it's also maybe you're in an outdoor application when there's too, mo too much light. Um, again, a neutral density filter can help as it you know, evenly cuts the, the light across the, um, across the spectrum. They can also be used to create um, shallow depth of field effects. Um, you can leave your camera op uh, lens open and use neutral density filters, stack them one on top of each other to create um, almost like a, you know, a fake aperture. And um, neutral density filters come in different ODs or different optical densities. Um, the higher the optical density, and again, these can be stacked, um, the higher the optical density, um, the less transmission that um, you're gonna get. And so um, it's something that um, lots of, Applica you know, lots of people who are working with applications aren't aware of, um, but um, you know, neutral density filter is a, it, it's a great filter to use in those applications where there's too much light. Now, as we move along, we'll talk about multi-band pass filters. Um, these filters are used in um, lots of different applications, um, surveillance, license plate recognition. Um, and this is mostly because in these types of applications, we're using two different light sources or we're imaging at day and at night. Um, if you remember um, in a transmission curve that I showed you initially, it had one pass band. So these filters are called multi-band pass because they have two or more pass bands. Um, so if you're dealing with a license plate rec recognition kind of application, um, 
you need visible light during the day um, to get a clear image of that license plate. Uh, so you're using sunlight during the day, but then at night you might be using an infrared light source um, to capture something like a license plate. And so, you know, up until now, lots of applications would use two cameras, one for the day, one for the night, or they would use um, a camera with a filter that switches in and out, depending on what light source that were you that you were using. Um, but with multi-band pass filters, um, you know, you can use one one filter, one camera, one lens, and these filters help to optimize uh, for the light source that you're using. Um, these multi-band pass filters can also be used for NDVI tap applications, um, where you're using uh, camera, digital cameras, uh, to look at the vegetative health of crops. Um, so we have lots of customers instead of, you know, getting an expensive um, a uh, team with an airplane and a multi-spectral camera to fly over and to look at uh, vegetative health. Um, you know, you can use a, a drone, a GoPro, um, one of the multi-band pass filters and the software to determine a lot of the same data. And so we have lots of uh, customers who are, who are doing that. And uh, again, something, a filter that you should be aware of. Um, as we continue, uh, I want to talk just to, for a moment about UV fluorescence imaging. Um, and this is these are applications where you're using UV light to cause something to fluoresce, whether it be a barcode or maybe some kind of grease or adhesive that you're trying to detect. Um, in these types of applications, uh, a filter can help to create contrast. Um, in you know, usually with other applications, say with a with a bandpass filter you're matching the bandpass filter to the light source. Um, so if you're using a, a red light for inspection, you're matching it with a red bandpass filter because it'll help to block ambient light, but pass the red. Uh, same thing with the blue light. If you're using a blue blue light, you're matching the uh, bandpass filter to the light source, um, getting a blue filter and uh, blocking interfering light and passing the blue. Uh, with UV fluorescence imaging, your first thought it might be, well, I'm using a UV light source, I better get a UV bandpass filter. But in this case, we're not really looking to pass the light, we're looking to pass what's being emitted um, uh, by what's fluorescing. And so in this original color image, I'm trying to uh, detect some um, grease or adhesive that's, that's present here. Um, when I use a UV light um, with no filter, um, it's really hard to detect any kind of contrast. There's some glare that's actually being caused by the light itself. And um, this is actually a blue emission that's happening here. And so I'm using a blue bandpass filter. And that's because, because this is a, a blue fluorescence, I'm using the bandpass filter to pass the emission, but block um, the light that's causing that glare and, um, and, and not giving me the contrast that I want. So when you're when you're dealing with UV fluorescence imaging, when you're using a UV light to cause something to fluoresce, you're matching the uh, filter that you want to use to the emission and not the source wavelength, not to the UV light. So something important to keep in mind. Um, as we talk about um, uh, fluorescence a little bit here, um, I want to introduce uh, a newer product that we came out with. It's called our Backlight Flora Sheet. Uh, this is a film. Um, like a vinyl paper, vinyl film um, kind of material. Um, and this really helps to create a backlight effect. Um, the way it works is um, you can uh, use it as the background for some material um, and place uh, something to be inspected on top. Uh, use a blue light, a blue 470 light, a front light to cause it to fluoresce orange and then you use a orange bandpass filter to capture the orange fluorescence, but block the blue light. And so it might, it might be a little difficult to picture, but I'm using a blue light here to cause this film to fluoresce. And then in a monochrome system, I'm using an orange bandpass filter to capture that orange emission and to block the blue light. And so what happens is it, it gives um, almost a backlight effect. You can use this as a substitute for a backlight, um, maybe in applications where you don't have enough room to put a backlight um, or you need to put a backlight on a curved surface it's because this film is very flexible and has an adhesive backing, it's tear resistant. Um, you, know, you can get 
uh, something like this. So this is a part that's sitting on the orange paper uh, on the back by floor sheet. I'm using a blue front light. Um, it's fluorescing orange. And then this image is uh, my monochrome system with an orange bandpass filter. And so I can see the details, um, again, creating a backlight, backlight type effect. Um, so uh, very interesting application uh, use cases. Um, if you'd like a sample of one, please reach out to Kale and um, you know, we, can, we can work on getting an application so you can test this in your lab. But um, uh, so very yeah. interesting results. Hey, Georgie, I'm going to interrupt here because we've run into several applications, just like you said, that there's not room to put a backlight. You're a very narrow between up against the side of a conveyor or the rest of the machine, but this sheet's able to slide right in. And, and the effects of it has really been impressive. We've been able to, to solve some new things with this. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, so um, now I'd just like to uh, take a moment and just look at a few um, kind of next, gener application, next generation applications that we're seeing um, that are specifically using bandpass filters. These are just being worked on by some of our customers and um, you know, they're just cool application and really help you think about um, you know, as you're designing things, as you're maybe looking at new business, as um, you're looking at different applications, you know, how you can use bandpass filters or um, cover windows or uh, polarizers, how you can use them in different ways. Um, so one application here is um, an operator alertness system. Um, we have a customer that's using these two, um, uh, these systems that are mounted on the front dashboard of, of their uh, big trucks that are going into, um, into mining. Um, and so they're using an infrared light to detect if um, the operator's eyes are open or if they're, if they're getting drowsy or if they're paying attention to the road. Um, we're seeing this, these kinds of applications kind of break out into the consumer market too. Um, so if you, have a, if you drive a newer car, that's, um, that will let you know if the operator is falling asleep or it'll, sometimes will cause it to rumble the, uh, the steering wheel. Uh, this is what it's doing. So it's using an infrared light um, and an infrared bandpass filter. So this blocks any interfering light that's coming inside the car. Um, it, the bandpass filter will help to block any uh, light that's coming through the windshield and, uh, and just pass um, whatever wavelengths that the system is using. Um, so uh, very interesting application. Um, another application that um, one of our customers shared with us is um, the self-navigating uh, and Collision, collision avoidance drones. Um, so these are drones that were, um, they're released into um, just very dense areas um, like you're seeing in this image. And they're using a series of ultraviolet lighting to help keep track of one another. Uh, but they're moving for, they're able to move forward um, in a, um, you know, to, a, to a destination, uh, but also keeping track of one another uh, through the use of these uh, ultraviolet lights that are constantly blinking. And here they're using a couple of different filters to help make sure that the drones are able to sense the UV light um, and also block any um, ambient light that's, uh, that might cause some interference. So a very cool application. Um, you know, if you think about a lot of dro drones roaming the forest, you know, whether it be for um, uh, maybe some surveying application or a search and rescue application, um, something that's uh, that's really cool. Um, again, um, optical filters help to make this happen. Um, another growing kind of application, especially in uh, car manufacturing, is uh, just 3D laser metrology. Um, metrology is simply just the, the science of measurements. And so, you know, they're using these um, um, uh, lasers, um, sometimes uh, blue or sometimes red, to make uh, thousands of measurements uh, in, inside of a car um, of, a, of a particular part um, so that that part can be made over and over again and the fit and finish is exactly the same as the parts that were made before it. Um, and so these kinds of applications use, um, you know, high intensity lasers and again, filters help to block the ambient light um, and just pass the wavelengths that the sensor cares about the sensor is looking for. Um, so, you know, lots of interesting applications. Um, and again, applications that are all using optical filters uh, to help make that happen. Um, 
Now, one of the uh, things that I want to wrap up with is the key features of machine vision filter. Um, you know, you can get machine vision filters from lots of different sources, um, but we want to suggest uh, Midwest Optical. And um, there's different key features that you should be looking for when selecting a filter. And I just want to go over those very quickly. Uh, the first is um, wavelength control. Um, there's a couple of different ways to manufacture filters. Um, one way is to take glass and apply a coating to it, and that's what creates um, this passband. But what happens with filters like that is if light is coming in at an angle, um, that passband that's supposed to be passing the light that you're desiring to pass, excuse me, can actually uh, start to shift if that light is coming in at an angle. The way that Midwest Optical manufactures filters is using a hybrid design in which um, the left side of this passband is actually created by the glass substrate itself, and the right side is created by the coating. And so what happens on MidOps filters um, with this technology that we call Stable Edge is that when light is coming in at an angle, instead of the passband shifting, it stays stable, uh, it does not shift over. And so a real world consequence of this is, um, like in this example, if I'm using a uh, red colored light for inspection and I'm using a red band pass filter to optimize that light, um, instead of passing red like it's supposed to be, if that angle is shifting for whatever reason, it starts to shift over to the left instead of passing red, it's blocking red and uh, passing green instead. And so what happens in your application is you're gonna see less light um, causing a darker image or a poor image to come through. And so um, it, that wavelength control is, is something important and that stable edge technology um, is only offered on Midwest optical filters. Um, and uh, this is also important to keep in mind if you're using a uh, shorter focal length lens, um, as machine vision systems become more and more compact, uh, customers are specking in shorter focal length lenses for a wider field of view. And so when you use a wider field of view, the angle um, along the edge um, of, the, of the light that's coming into the lens is uh, at a higher degree or a higher angle. And so if you're using a filter, again, that does not have stable edge built in, what you're gonna be seeing is um, less light, uh, a poorer image across the edges. And while a stable edge filter, that pass band is gonna be not shifting, um, and um, you know, allowing wavelengths through. And while a flat top design is okay, it's not optimal. We design our filters with a, a Gaussian or a bell shaped design. Uh, we find this the most efficient way to design it just because um, oftentimes with the LED that you're using, um, the LED is also being outputted in a Gaussian or a bell shaped um, output. And so um, the bell shaped uh, design or the Gaussian design is what we find to be the most uh, efficient way to capture the output, but also block uh, any interfering wavelengths. Um, here in this um, just color ambient image of these colored letters, um, just having it lit by uh, ambient light. I'll use a red flat top filter. Um, so it's passing the red wavelengths. So in a monochrome system, you should be seeing the G and the A uh, highlighted, which you are here. But because of that flat top filter design, it's also allowing other wavelengths that you might not want to pass. Um, and so you're not getting as much contrast um, as, as probably desired or needed. Um, with the red Gaussian design filter, um, I'm getting plenty of contrast. You can see that um, the difference is pretty, pretty clear. And so how the passband is designed is also um, a key feature and something to keep in mind of when selecting an optical filter. The types of coatings that are applied um, to, to the filter are also very important. Um, when you're using some glass um, and the light is going through that glass, uh, or sorry, a filter, um, there's some immediate reflection, internal reflection that happens that causes some light loss. Um, you can lose eight to 10% of light right away. And so an AR coating applied to that filter or optical component, cover glass, whatever you have in front of your lens is very important to reduce the amount of of light that's lost. So um, without an AR coating applied to that filter, um, you can lose eight to 10%. Um, with, with one applied, um, you know, it's, it's reduced down to one to 2%. Um, so it's um, very beneficial to have that. 
And that's something that we apply to uh, almost our entire filter line. You can see the difference here. Um, here's a filter on a lens with no coating. You can see the amount of reflection that's happening. Um, here's a filter with a less expensive uh, mag, flow, mag fluoride single layer coating. Uh, you can see that there's some reflection that's happening. Um, and here, this is a broadband AR multi-layer coating that um, that will help you, um, you know, reduce the amount of uh, light loss and reflections that are happening. And so, again, anti-reflection coatings are are very important, um, and they can make a difference in an application that's already you know, starving for light or doesn't have enough light. So, another key feature to keep in mind: um, the performance of the optics, how the optics um, you know, optic is performing. Uh, performing is very important. Um, you know, you're probably specking a, a, a rather expensive camera, getting a high quality lens. It doesn't make sense to put um, a, a poor filter or a poor uh, polycarbonate window or some kind of uh, inexpensive color glass, uh, cover glass to protect your lens uh, because it can affect the final image. It can cause some, introduce some distortion that you weren't aware of. Um, and uh, it's something important to keep in mind. Uh, Midwest Optical inspects 100% of the of the optics of the filters that leaves our building. Um, we test for both um, any scratches or digs, but also to see how that filter or cover glass is performing. Um, and so um, even uh, even how the filter is mounted in the uh, filter mount, uh, you have your filter mount, you have your filter, and then you have a retaining in, uh, ring that keeps that filter in there. And so even over tightening that, that retaining ring um, can cause some stress in the glass, um, causing some distortion in your final image. So again, something else to keep in mind. Um, and as we you know, just finish up talking about mounting solutions, we offer lots of different ways to get that filter onto your lens, um, whether it be a threaded mount, um, a C mount, uh, 25.4 C mount. This is for applications where you can't put the filter in front of the lens, but you can thread it behind the lens in front of the sensor. Um, slip mounts for lenses without any threads. Uh, you slip the filter right over the lens and tighten it down with some set screws. Um, or if you need an unmounted or custom shape for size, um, you know, working with ACS, we can get you something very quickly um, instead of waiting six or eight weeks for um, for a custom or unmounted shape. Um, you know, we can get you something in one to two weeks. Uh, custom solutions for M12 lenses. Um, so if you're using uh, a smaller lens, maybe for uh, adorable applications or surveillance applications, you're probably using a, a much smaller lens. Uh, we have ways to mount filters there or even uh, cementing the filter right to the lens and um, supplying the whole assembly. Um, so again, lots of different uh, mounting solutions for you. Um, and finally, um, one question is, you know, there's, there's um, so many filters. Um, how do I know which one? Um, honestly, the best way to do to kind of uh, see which filter is best for your application is to get one of our filter um, test kits. Uh, we have several different kinds, with you know different kinds of filters for different kinds of applications. And um, you know, unfortunately, we it's not an exact science in that I can't tell you exactly what filters are going to work every single time. Uh, but this filter test kits um, will help you get started on that on the right path. Um, and it's also good to have. Um, you know, if you're testing for a customer or if you're testing in a lab, uh, this is a great way to uh, to make sure that you select the right filter uh, for your application. And that is uh, it for me. Uh, I think that's my time as well. Um, but I, I hope you have some time for questions, right, Gail? Absolutely. So uh, I think we've answered all the questions as we've gone through. But if anybody has any questions here at the end. Uh, please be sure to post them in the chat room. I'm going to be watching it for another minute. I did want to make everybody aware that here at ACS, we partner very closely with Midwest Optical. They are a great resource for us. We have vision inspection labs located in our Marietta office, our Knoxville office, our Spring Hill, Tennessee office, as well as our new Birmingham office. And in every one of those labs, we are set up with a full complement of Midwest Optical filters. If you have an application where you need to test, need to borrow a filter or you want to send us parts, be more than happy to work with you. Please reach out to us, shoot me a comment with your contact information, and I can email you who your local representative is for that. Uh, 
If it's something beyond what we get into, uh, as you were talking about the neutral density filters, Georgie, I had an application a number of years ago at a manufacturing facility that was doing a molten ceramic. And we, it, we were actually measuring the molten stream of material. And we actually had to stack up three neutral density filters to cut down the light so much where we could measure the width of the stream. And we were using it on a PID loop with a camera to be able to control the flow of the material because the hotter it was, the less viscous and the more it flowed. So we used it to be able to help do the furnace controls and the flow control by using those neutral densities. So in that particular application, we didn't have the right filters and we were able to bring Midwest Optical in and use their resources in their lab as an extension of ours to be able to prove that application out. And it's working very successfully. Excellent. So, I love hearing that. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any more new questions coming in. Uh, I will let everyone know that this event has been recorded. We are going to post it onto our website and our on-demand webinar section. So as you get new hires or if you need a refresher, because I was uh, just talking to one in the chat room to one of the other guys up at Midwest that there were several parts of this presentation I had actually forgotten about. I've been doing vision for a while, so it was nice to have that refresher for me. So if anyone out there is like that, would like the refresher or to have a new hire go through, you can check our website. We'll probably have it posted within the next week. Uh, we'll also wind up posting this to our YouTube channel so you can watch it there as well. Be sure to like us on YouTube. And Georgie, I want to thank you for your time this morning and the sharing of your knowledge. Uh, any last minute things you want to share with the group? No, like I started out uh, saying, filters are uh, a necessity. And, uh, you know, we I just hope that it's something that you think about and you reach out to ACS um, as you're considering designing your application or uh, as you come in, come across an issue. But uh, thanks again to Kale and to ACS for allowing Midwest and myself to do this. Appreciate it. Thank you. The chat room is clear, so we'll let everybody go. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.